Alrighty guys, welcome to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre reunion panel. All right. Cool. Put your hands together for John Dugan and Terry McMinn. Alright guys, I'm going to ask a question or two, get it started, and then as soon as I see hands going up out there, I'll start calling them out. Um, guys, thank you so much for being here. We're oh, thanks for enormous, having us. Uh, we're enormous fans. Um, so there's a lot that is known about the production of this film, so I'm going to try and see if we can possibly venture into some stuff that, that some of these hardcore fans don't know. I've always been curious, uh, what can you guys tell us about what you remember about first getting the script and how the project was pitched to you guys initially? I got a phone call from Kim Henkel, who um, was married to my sister, so it was like total nepotism, you know. <laughs> but uh, I was doing a children's play in Chicago called The Terradiddle Tales. Two shows a day, six days a week for $175. <laughs> Dressed up in tights, dancing around telling folk tales from around the world to the inner city children of Chicago. I literally could not be more opposite. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. and Kim called me and said, hey man, are you crazy? <laughs> and I said, yeah, of course, what do you need? And he, he told me he's doing this film. And uh, he, he uh, wanted me to be a part of it, so. I gave notice, and a couple weeks later, I was in Texas. Wow. That's awesome. Terry, what do you remember about uh, first getting the script and having a pitch to you? So I was uh, living in Austin, and I was doing plays at St. Edwards University at Mary Moody Northern Theater, and I was doing a play with a man named Frank Sutton. He was a uh, Gummer Piles sergeant, and it was a TV series at that time. And um, I was in a shot in the Austin American Statesman, and um, my eyes were closed, and I was bending over a dead body. And um, they saw my picture in the paper. They'd been around to all the different schools, SMU, UT, uh, Texas Tech, all the schools, and they'd seen about 500 girls and a friend of mine said, oh, you know, you ought to, you ought to go and audition for that, because they'd called the school and asked for me to come, and I thought, you know, it's a non-union scab film. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking I'm gonna be doing Chekhov and Edward Albee, you know, and all that. And uh, I said, oh, he said, ah, oh, Terry, just go read for him, you know. So I went and I read, and I left, and then my friend said, well, had to go and I said oh it went alright you know and he said well call him and tell him you want the role so I said okay so I called and I said oh I really really would like to be in your film <laughs> you know and I really really didn't think I would like to be in their film but anyway um, they said okay you know I, they said oh Kim said uh, okay Terry he said come down tonight and wear some short shorts and I'm thinking, ooh, <laughs> ow, uh. ah, you know. So I put on my little white short shorts with embroidered flowers going up the side and my pink knit top. And I got on my bicycle and I rode over <laughs> to the audition. <laughs> and I um, read, you know, something about <coughs> chainsaws and Saturn in retrograde. And I had no idea, really what I was getting into at all. Wow. And that's how I got cast. Wow, classic. The, uh, obviously, one of the things the production is you know, famous for is you know, the brutal, condi brutal conditions, the grueling heat, you know, limited resources, uh, unique aromas. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, was, oh, I was always curious what the one part of making that film that you'll just never be able to forget. Yes. Oh. Um. Probably d shooting that dinner party scene, which was just grueling. It was just awful, right. over and over and over again. And Toby, I don't know if he continued working this way in his career, but instead of doing a master or two masters, you know, doing a master shot from one end of the table and a master from the other side, and maybe one from broadside, and then cutting everybody's close-ups, when we did the close-ups, we had to do the whole fucking scene again. <laughs> so we ran through the whole scene every time. So when we got to the two shots, the close-ups, 
we start at the top and do the whole scene again. I mean, he was burning up film like crazy, and it, which is odd because we didn't have any money, you know, for for <laughs> for the lab or anything. Uh, so it just went forever. And I, you know, I was five hours in the makeup chair, and then I had to work for like twenty six hours. You know, it was just ridiculous. Yeah, I was gonna say I read and, that and was a little And he just kept beating it to him over and over and over again, and. Now, you know, it just dawned on me a few years ago. I was watching the film with fans, you know, in a movie theater. And the, he di the tension is so thick in that scene, it's palpable. You know, you can just oh, yeah. feel it. Donna, maybe he did that on purpose. And, and he just pushed us until we were ready to say, yeah, let's I fucking kill her. I want to go home, you know. <laughs> I want a beer and a nap. And, um, and maybe he he had done that until he just got what he wanted and said, "Okay, that's a wrap for the day," you know that sort of thing. I, I, who knows? It could have been just a fluke. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know how much this stuff. You know, people uh, read so much into the yeah. into the film. It's so legendary over the years. Like it was a uh, you know a analogy for the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, all sorts of crap. Watergate, it, it, yeah. What's it? That shit. <laughs> Bullshit, you know. But once somebody says it, and Kim Henkel is a guy who'll play right into that shit. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and, and Toby, you know. Well, I remember. I don't think I falls for it all. Yeah, I read it on the internet once. And I'm like, it must be true. I remember because I was doing a play at night. I was doing the Rainmaker with Peter Breck by the time we were filming, and um, I remember going to the theater at night, and they'd have Watergate hearings on in the green room, so we were listening to them at night and because I wasn't around thank God I wasn't around for the dinner party oh no <laughs> so we had all that food out there we we had no ventilations it, it was close to 100 degrees ambient temperature outside then all the windows were shut and blacked out and then they pop about 10,000 watts of tungsten up and shit you can cook on that shit I mean it's hot and uh, no ventilation and, and all this meat in, on the table and a lot of us like raw they had raw um, they had, uh, what is this the, the sausage in Texas is it hot links Texas hot links is that what they call mm -hmm. oh come on you went <laughs> you down. I did too but sausage you know that they're supposed to be cooked and smoked and grilled and all that stuff and the PA just they had bought like like five pounds of raw sausage and slap it on the table there so it's starting to sweat and kind of cook slowly rot and there's flies crawling on it. It was just fucking disgusting. Uh, everybody smelled. Gunner, Gun couldn't, they, his shirt was hand dyed by the costume woman, the wardrobe mistress, uh, Dottie. Uh, like in her apartment in Austin with a box of writ dye, you know, that sort of thing. And then it, down to them, they were afraid to wash it because it, it wouldn't match. So he had to wear the same shirt the entire shirt. And he's a big, he was a big guy. And he it was weighed hot. 350 when we did the film. Wow. The what? He weighed 350 when we did the film. He, he sweat a lot. He lost 100 over the years. He lost 100 pounds, you know, and he'd really trimmed down by the time, you know. But he, uh, he it wasn't, it was like off-planet B.O. He it didn't even smell human. <laughs> It was like a sweaty Martian or some shit. It was, <laughs> I don't know what a Martian smells like. <laughs> but it was just unbelievable. You know, nobody could get close to him. Poor guy, nobody, he, you know, we'd break for lunch and he had to sit all by himself because nobody could stand to sit next to him. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, really. <laughs> it was bad. And the, the whole crew stunk and everything stunk and I stunk. and It was uh, hot and miserable. But we got it done. Translated I was to 20 years old, you know, and we we're making a movie. Yeah. You know, so you do whatever it takes because, you know, the show must go on, you know, that, that whole showbiz thing. Absolutely. You know, you do it, you do what you have to do. And you, you stay there until you get it done. So we all had that kind of work ethic, yeah. you know. Awesome. Next questions. Was there any sense from either of you while you were on the set that maybe you were doing something special? It's going to be sorry. memorable, uh, and iconic. It's going to be like a future Halloween. No, I, I was doing a, a play at the end, and they wanted me for some pickup shots, and I didn't have an agent. And um, uh, so they wanted me to do the pickup shots, and I had negotiated 
to go and do the Rainmaker with Peter Breck, and I negotiated $600 a week, which Peter looked at me and said, I cannot believe that they're going to pay you that, Terry. <laughs> because that, at that time, that was, you know, dinner theater, you didn't make that. So anyway, I called Kim and I told him that, you know, I had this offer. When, and I, when do you want to do the day of pickup shots? Because I want to do it before, you know, this run. And they threatened me because we'd signed a money, you know, we hadn't made any money in, the, in the, that time. I'd lost my waitressing job. I needed money. And uh, they threatened me, and I was so nervous about it, and I went to Andy Devine. Andy was Jingles, the sidekick for Roy Rogers. And uh, you yeah, stagecoach, he was the stagecoach driver, Iron Buck, Iron you know. For Gene Autry, and, he um, for Gene Autry. He, you know, Andy thinks I'm like some whiny little thing, and he's, oh, Terry, that goddamn thing will never come out of the fucking can. <laughs> In other words, shut up, you know, and just, go and do, and I was so intimidated by them threatening me because I'd signed this deferred money contract that I didn't go and do the six week run. Just didn't realize it would be deferred forever. I did not realize <laughs> You know, the deferred meant, you know, we'll only pay we'll you a little later. something if it's ever shown on the big screen. We'll pay you or, later. You know. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't have any real warm, fuzzy feelings, you know, for them <laughs> forever. <laughs> oh man, questions out there, guys? Oh, got one here, yeah. What did what did you do to get in the character for Terry when you when um, especially when Leatherface grabs you and is dragging you into the house? Oh, you know, I was so excited to do those scenes because I finally could really relate to to something like riding in the van. To Toby said, you know, your facial expressions are too big. I said, well, I throw up when I smell something bad. You know. <laughs> anyway, long story shorter. I really was excited to do those scenes because I felt like I could, you know, I'd been yeah. training in theater since I was 13, 14, so I was really ready. This was like my moment. I was so excited. And um, Gunnar and I had, Gunnar and I worked really well together, and so I was, um, I just got into it. And I really didn't have to do a lot because he was a big guy. He's trying to pull me outside of everywhere, and Toby would have 35 angles for one, you know. Jeez. I mean, literally, the guy, we shot from 9 in the morning until we were losing light at 7.30, I can recall. And I had been screaming and running and fighting a 350-pound man with all my might. And, you know, I didn't hold anything back. I was just lucky that I didn't hit my legs on things or, or whatever, but I could not walk. I couldn't scream at the end of the day. They were giving me Jack Daniels to drink neat, just so, because it's hard to do those scenes and not really yell, or you know what I mean? Because just to go, you know, it just felt fake. So I was a trooper, and like John said, you know, we really, we took it very seriously. Very seriously, yes. And, um, it came out that way on the screen. I mean, it really came out that I could really, you know, feel the emotion. You, yeah, I, I, now I feel that way. For 30 years, though, I would watch it and i go, oh, if only you had, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> like most actors, you just beat yourself up. And so for 30 like years, I stayed now. back. And then somebody said when I finally, in 2008, they were trying to get me to come out. They said, well, Terry, you know, your scenes are taught in directing classes across the world. I went, oh, please, <laughs> you've got to be, you know. And so I had just found out what YouTube was, you know. And so I thought, I wonder if anybody can see if I'm going on YouTube, you know. <laughs> I had no real clue what, what internet was or anything. And so I'm going on YouTube like thinking, I hope they can't see that I'm going on here, you know. <laughs> so I watched my scenes. Take you two hours to download it. You know, buffering, buffering, <laughs> buffering, buffering. <laughs> but I watched the scene and I finally went. I I think I almost cried and I said, "Oh, Terry, you weren't bad," you know. Yeah. And I finally 
embraced it. That's awesome. So it was a nice feeling. I love the film. I think it's well done. It's well directed. The cinematography is beautiful. The soundtrack is great. The acting is top notch. The writing is fantastic. I I like it a lot. I'm proud of it. Uh, I feel fortunate now. Um, I can actually piggyback on that. You mentioned the sound. It's one of my favorite things about the film is the the sound design. It was so unique for the time, and I was wondering if if that was something that was a total surprise to you guys. I was or? surprised. That was that was uh, Toby Hooper and Wayne Bell in Toby's apartment banging on shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I read it. And uh, it was really, it, man, it worked, didn't it? Oh, yeah, amazing, amazingly. Uh, I'm sure there was a little cannabis involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was Austin, Texas in 1973. I think there was more than cannabis involved. Yeah, there may have been. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> but I'm sure there was cannabis involved. Because <laughs> we actually, there was some growing outside. Uh, yeah, there was like several and plants. And those were a, some long days. There was you a know? patch back there. <laughs> we'd wait for a cloud to roll by and yeah. that would take two hours. So there was a lot of hanging out and... When we first arrived on the set, there were no, you know, there were no chairs with your name on it or, you know, no air-conditioned RV or something like that. I mean, I can remember that we, one of us would be in the hammock and the other one would be, two of us would be up on the porch, the swing was on the porch, and then there was one chair or you know, and we would rotate. And then finally, after about a week, they got us some chairs, I think. It was very low budget. My first morning on set, uh, I had flown in from Chicago overnight. I like, picked up at 6 a.m. Kim Hinkle picked me up. He said, do you want to go get some sleep? Or they're, we're setting up right now. You want to go out to location? I said, well, let's go out to location, you know. And we got there, and they were, they were setting up. They were working that whole day on the shots at the deserted grandfather's house thing. Um, like Sally's grandpa's old house or whatever that thing was there. But you're going to go to those fishing oh, holes. we're going to have fun. Yeah, huh? fishing hole, yeah. <laughs> and, we're going to uh, have a lot of fun. <laughs> Paul Partain, Franklin, is, uh, is uh, sitting in his wheelchair behind his Cadillac convertible. He had a white, huge white Cadillac convertible with red leather interior, big pointy fins that long. Trunk was open. He was sitting in his uh, uh, wheelchair with a little semicircle of folding lawn chairs around him, like in a little conversation grouping, but nobody was sitting there with him, <laughs> just sitting all alone, you know, with his feet like that. He had his slippers sewn together at the toes so it would turn his feet in. <laughs> and I started talking to him, and he got all excited. He says, grab yourself a drink, partner, and sit down here with me. And he had a huge cooler uh, full of ice down with uh, the 16 ounce bottles of Coca-Cola and uh, cans of Budweiser and I grabbed a beer at six o'clock in the morning which I still do <laughs> <laughs> wash down my vitamins in the morning with the, uh, but, um, all my supplements not Budweiser though I, um, but <laughs> um, then we just started you know talking and became fast friends everybody else thought he was an asshole because he just never broke character you know but God <laughs> You know, well, you didn't the have any scenes with no, him. No, I didn't have to we, act with him, yeah. <laughs> he stayed in character the whole day. And so we would all, between takes, you know, be kidding around and trying to have some fun. And uh, Franklin was, oh, all day. <laughs> so I never got to know him. Paul was apparently a really nice guy. Oh, person. he was a super <laughs> nice guy. Super nice guy. And he was a hell of an actor. I still, the, the character is still. If you if you knew Kim Henkel, you'd understand. <laughs> but this is he. You know, Kim Henkel is the first person who ever wrote a handicapped character. You know, someone you know paralyzed in a wheelchair who's an asshole. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's usually a sympathetic character. <laughs> Put a guy in a wheelchair and make him a fucking asshole. <laughs> on top of it, I think it's just brilliant. You know. <laughs> Any questions out there, guys? I can't believe the grandpa was only 20 years old. Yeah, 20. I was 20. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. Did you, uh, you're 20 and all that makeup they got. Did you, you 
question their wisdom, why not just hire some old, old actors? There aren't a lot of whole, there's not a lot of 110 year old actors out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't seen many. There must be torture that late. Uh, it was awful. It was really, really awful. It was awful. a plastic surgeon that designed that. Yeah, he was a cosmetic surgeon, Dr. Barnes. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a, a plastic surgeon, a painter, a sculptor. A photographer. He was a photographer for Penthouse Magazine for 30 years. Uh, he was young, uh, talented, stinking rich man, and he, he was just a, when it came to makeup. He was just a uh, he was a hobbyist. He 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 played with it. So he took a cast of my face and aged it. He said, "If you live to be 110 years old, or 113, or however old Grandpa was supposed to be, he said you very likely will look like this." <laughs> I was like, she's great to know, Doc. Thanks, you know. Uh, <laughs> but he had this house. Oh God, he had this house in the in the the hills on the in the north of Austin, backed up into these rocky hills, with an in-ground concrete swimming pool. His master bedroom suite overlooked the deep end of the of the pool, and he had a sliding glass door and a wooden platform out there, so he could roll out of bed and dive from the second floor into the deep end of his pool for a thing in the morning. I thought, man, I gotta get me one of these things here. So I became an actor and a bit broke my whole life. So. <laughs> Dreams come true. Yeah. <laughs> another question. I want to ask Apple, how many days did it take to shoot this film from getting back? <coughs> oh boy. It was about five weeks. Um, the I came middle, out, you know, the, the, the shot where it's on Wikipedia, but I've got my hands resting on my legs and I'm looking pretty miserable. That's like my 22nd birthday. And they, you know, I was very angry because they needed me to come out and do the sh audio for the picking up the tooth. Scene, and I'm thinking I'm missing out on six hundred dollars. I'm shooting this for freaking nothing, you know. And I'm miserable because they had threatened me and intimidated me. And I never saw that picture. Sally, Sally uh, Richardson. Richardson walked by. She was the ADP, and she walked by. And she and I was sitting looking straight ahead, and she said, "Hey, Tara, look over here." And I went. You know, and so I never saw the picture. And then, when I finally came out in 2008, somebody said, "Hey, Terry, you know you're on Wikipedia," and I went, "Yeah, right." You know, <laughs> and I went, "Oh my God!" And there was that picture, and there was that day, and it just, you know, everything came flooding back about what had happened and. Everything came came back to fruition. So that's a very popular shot now. <laughs> Curious again, you know, I mean, uh, this changed the shape of horror movies because prior to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I mean, horror movies usually involved monsters, you know, classic monsters, uh, vampires, werewolves, space right. aliens. And this kind of really, even though it had been done before with Hitchcock Psycho, this really got the thing going where the, the most horrifying monster is the serial killer before there was even the term. I'm just curious, it's Texas, this is 74 when you shot this. Were the, uh, were, were, were the, the Dean Coral murders weighing on They were happening right then. Yeah, okay. Right when yeah. we were shooting, the Dean Coral was, yeah. And um, at that time, you know, a lot of people don't realize this was so controversial, Marilyn, Bill, and I took it off of our resumes. Because I remember I was going to theater auditions, and I remember a director looking at me and he went, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, what is that? I mean, it was so despicable, and it was banned. It was so controversial, you know, that for me it did mean no good. I don't know how much good it did. It, it certainly didn't open doors in Hollywood. I, I've had casting directors, you know, look at your resume and go, you had a lot. You were the Texas that? Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, because you know? remember it was non-union. Yeah, it had not become a thing yet. Oh, no, it took 10 you know, years. It had not 
10 years. It, it wasn't a, it was just something to be made fun of, you know. Johnny Carson poked fun at, you know, people started Everybody using Everybody put it, 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 started, it kind of became a catchphrase for something that's disgusting. That's like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know. First sequel was 12 years later, right? Yeah, I guess. You didn't come for 12 yeah. years. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Right, and remember it was banned in the UK for 25 years. It was banned in Germany, banned in... Until 2013 in Germany. I, I was living in New Hampshire at the time. There was a very right-wing publisher who worked for the newspaper up there. His name was William Love, the Manchester Union leader. When this opened in the theaters in his own... He wrote an editorial in his own paper questioning the taste and wisdom of the local theaters releasing a movie like this. Like, how dare they... I, I, went, I went the day it opened. Kind of interesting. What well, year was that? 1974, October. Mm -hmm. I went to the day it opened, and it was kind of funny. I went to like the first screening. I, I would read. I read Rex Reed's review in the New Right. Movie. He loved it. Right. And I remember when I went. I, this is New Hampshire, you know, kind of conservative back then. I was the only one in the theater. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, I was the only one that bought a ticket. Wow. And I'm sitting there. And there's this thing on wow. wow. It was a very memorable experience. Oh yeah. Did it have a second release? Like. I remember it came out when I was seven. It was too young to see it, but I remember it coming out in theaters again. And it was 1980. I made my mom yeah. buy a ticket so I could go to see it. Well, it was the most rented video of the 80s, you know. And I remember because I wasn't even out then, and I was giving a party at my house in Austin, and God, even in '95, you know. And everybody else, like Gunner, was coming by my house to get me to sign pictures that he would sell at shows, <laughs> that he would take and sell at shows. And he'd say, oh, you ought to come to one, you know, and I was busy, I had a flower business. I was, you know, I, I just went on and lived my life. And um, I remember I was at a video store and I thought, well, I, I should just rent it and see it, you know. And I didn't even tell the guy that I was <laughs> in it or anything. But anyway, I was giving a party at my house and there were about 30 people there and my good friends, about three or four of them, knew that I had done this film. And so I heard somebody say, oh no, she, she was in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You know, out of the corner of my eye. And, no. and then this other person went, she was the girl on the meat hook? Are you kidding me? You know, and it, began to sort of dawn on me that, wow, this thing has really come a long way since, you know, because I had just kind of put it in a drawer and, you know, it wasn't. So it was pretty amazing, though, when we went to Cherry Hill and Bill and I came out for the first oh, time yeah. together. That was a good show. We appeared. I didn't stop signing for three days. I had writer's cramp by Sunday. It, you yeah. d it just, it was the first time all of us had been together the entire living cast. Paul had passed away by that point, but Jim was still alive, and we but had. He to, wasn't we had, at the show with us. I, I think he was. Uh -uh. He he was not. No, uh -uh. he was. He died in two thousand and four. I looked it up. Oh, oh, so he was dead too. Yeah. yeah. No, he wasn't there. Okay. Mm -mm, no, because I. Yeah, because that was two thousand. Jim, as far as I'm concerned. Seven or eight? It was the best two, that was two thousand six. I loved it? him. I was there. I think it was two thousand six. Yeah. It it was before Monster Mania for sure, because I I would have remembered if Jim had been there because yeah I no he like died if he died in two thousand four he definitely he died. Before well I looked show. it up because I was noticing something. Oh, what? Uh, questions out there, guys? But we had at that show we had one whole wall of the big room and people just came down the line and just and literally by I was by Sunday to sign that much but well, it was like chiching and everybody had said everybody had said to me Terry you you really are not going to believe how these fans are you know and I I, uh, I actually was just figuring out what memorabilia was, you know, I thought, memorabilia, why would these people want to talk to me, you know, I, I still was wrapping my brain around it, and by the end of Saturday, I looked around at everybody in the cast, and I said, can we do this, like, every <laughs> weekend? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I'd be there. How many other questions out there, guys? 
Well, I, I mean, it was it was shot under a different title. Yeah, head cheese. Uh, my script was head cheese. Some people's scripts had uh, Leatherface, I think, didn't it? When did, when did the? Uh, I thought mine said head cheese. Mine was head cheese. I mean, the title made it because the title was so transgressive on those marquees. When did that the title come in? Did the distributors think of that title? No, I don't think the distributors. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. It might be in Wikipedia, maybe. Yeah. You know, how that no, happened. I don't. That's a good question. I don't really know when and well, what it changed would and who. Know that answer. Well, the the next time I talk to Kim, I'll ask him. Yeah. Back in the 50s and 60s, there was a, a company that used to distribute low budget films called Crown International. Mm -hmm. They would change the titles and make these unknown movies into hits. They took a, they took a movie called Mad, Man, Mad Men of Honduras and changed the title to They Saved Hitler's Brain. And then it was a drive in hit. Right, right. The title does. Yeah. I can remember I was waiting tables in Dallas, which is about um, 200, 150 miles from Austin. And I had told a couple of people that I filmed this horror movie the summer before. And this would have been when it was coming out and the trailers were on, but I never watched TV at that time. And I was at standing at the bar waiting to get my drinks from my bartender. And he said, hey, didn't you tell me you were in some horror movie? You're in all the trailers. Mm -hmm. It's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You're in a, I said the Texas, Ch yeah, that's it, Texas Chainsaw. You're kidding me. Oh, uh, I'm in all the trailers, you know, because I figured it would be Marilyn, you know, never me. And I think, and when I saw the trailers, I went, damn, I'm in all the trailers. <laughs> so it was quite a shock. So we got one. I'm just going to state that, like, I suffer from migraines, and all I ever say is that, like, the back of my head feels like it's hanging on a meat hook. And that's what I always say. So that's the chainsaw I'm a Michael Myers fan. Uh, John Carpenter's Michael Myers girl. But yeah. I just always say that that's the back of my head feels like it's hanging on a meat hook. That Whoa. is the scene. When I, saw, I, when I saw it in the movie theater for the first time, it was the Chicago Theater, Chicago, Illinois, on State Street, which is a beautiful old uh, bundle, the house originally. And, and um, it was run down at the time, but they've since restored it. And there's live, it's a live performance venue now and everything. But that's where I saw it the first time with a probably three quarter house. And when Terry gets hung on that meat hook, it's when about 30% <laughs> of the audience stood up and walked out. And we're, we're telling, Terry, tell, uh, tell, telling Terry that she got a walking ovation in Chicago. But, uh, well, you it, know, the funniest part of that is um, Toby came up to me the day before we were gonna shoot that scene. He said, Terry, uh, we're going to shoot the meat hook tomorrow. Said, do you have any ideas about what you'll do and what you'd like to do? And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking about it, Toby. And I was thinking that maybe if the meat hook didn't hit her in some strategic part of her spine, that maybe she'd try to reach up and try and get off the hook. And Toby said, yeah. Let's go with that. <laughs> it's very effective. And I've had uh, numerous uh, arguments with, with people, with, with fans who think they see that meat hook go into her. You don't, you know. And you can say, no, this is your own sick fucking brain, man. <laughs> you saw that? Your but brain finishes the image, you know. But you don't see her get hung on the meat hook. You see her reaction to the meat hook. And you see the but bare back coming toward the hook. You That's see the hook. The, you see the back. You see the her, uh, 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 the way it's edited. And then he lets go over and, and that thing yanks you up. Because actually it was turned backwards. And she was on the meat hook, but the hook was facing the other direction. Right. And so he was hooked that loop on there and he, he let go of her and <laughs> dropped her. So <laughs> you get that, that jerking effect. He was just effect. spotting me so that when... And the, then her reaching up like that is so effective. the loop so went over the hook, it didn't go in my back. You know, so that was nice of them. Because when they had me, remember that scene when I run into the chicken room and I trip over the back? Okay. I was in that scene, but I was off camera. So, <laughs> so um, here I am with my little bare legs. You know, it's dark, and Toby says, okay, Jerry, action. So I run in, and I, the, the bucket has a serrated edge, you know, a, a 
it's one of those uh what do you call it's it? It's a wash tub. It's a bucket. It's oh, a bucket. It? Oh, yeah, oh that ceramic. okay, that was a bucket, yeah. It's yeah. A, I mean not it's a ceramic, enamel. But enamel bucket. Red and on the top a, and white, you know, old fashioned. Hard pale. Edge, you know, that kind of a lip that comes up like that. And so my shin, it hits my shin just so I can trip over it. And we did that thirteen times. I was and a chicken by angler. the time that we had finished, Toby, you know, I said, Toby, I can't do it anymore. You know, my leg is bleeding. It's bruised. It's, he was quite relentless in his, you know, misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> I was laying on the floor with a, with a broomstick poking the chicken. <laughs> poking the chicken cage right before they get ready to go. And I, I get the chicken clock in and get the cage Going. And Wayne, and really Wayne Bell was laying in, in a pile of feathers with the with a with a boom mic and a shotgun, booming it from underneath. <laughs> that was it. Did take a long time to do that fucking thing, didn't it? It took. Uh, I'm telling you, we filmed that. The meat hook scene started at nine. By noon, we were done. I mean, they came in with lunch, and I'm standing there, you know, and there are like 15 or 20 people. Everybody came to see that shot done, and everybody, you could have dropped a pin and heard it because it was just so, and when we finished, I saw everybody going, and you know, it sort of felt like we had something yeah. finally, oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. because up until then, it had been quite chaotic in some ways, you know, and not a lot of... Like, I remember Lou was our assistant DP mm -hmm. on the film, and I remember I'd finish a scene and I'd turn to Lou for, like, how was it? Was that okay? You know what I mean. Because I wasn't getting that from Toby or Ken yeah. or anybody, uh, especially. And so I would I would always turn to Lou and he'd go, okay. <laughs> and that really meant a lot. Yeah. Well, I always felt like that scene was kind of the spark that lit the fire of modern horror as we know it, so. That's, you know, one of my favorite scenes of all time. But um, unfortunately, I think we're just about out of time, guys. So why don't you guys put your hands together for this guy. Thank you. Thank you.